Kathy Cotton study here covering the ABCs of purchasing for you. Hope you all enjoy your training. The purpose of purchasing something is to ensure compliance with the state of Colorado fiscal rules, procurement code, personnel rules, and CNCC's policies and procedures. To ensure that every procurement transaction is documented appropriately, to abide by the state of Colorado fiscal rules, and to work smarter, not harder. What do I need to do? If you're looking to purchase something, you do need to ask yourself these few questions. What type of purchase are you making? Is it for travel, goods, or services? Have you looked at the rules and requirements? Do you have your backup documentation? Do please plan ahead and allow time for processing. Check your budget and make sure that you have asked for permission and gotten your authorizations for what it is you're wanting to purchase. And also, there are two methods of making purchase, and it's either on a direct pay or a purchase order or a purchase requisition. We'll cover that here in a little bit. You also want to consider invoices and unauthorized purchases. We'll also cover that in a little bit. So, is this purchase travel related? Travel related purchases would be placed on a travel card and there's only a handful of things that we can put on our travel cards because they are centrally billed. So it would be a hotel, rental car, things of the nature. No personal purchases whatsoever. And according to fiscal rule 5-1, meals are not allowed for single day travel. We do comply with the state for per diems, which is a 75% uh, ratio for your day of departure and day of return. We'll cover some of this during the travel training as well. Um, and we also need to have receipts for all things put on travel cards. So again, here's some links and information for what you're going to have um, access to for travel as well. So if you're going to be purchasing something for IT, we have a whole other realm that we need to look at there. And all IT purchases must go through the IT department. So any software, hardboard, hardware, keyboards, iPads, computer accessories, things of the nature. So you're going to submit your request to Fred Byers, and we have his email address and phone extension here as well. You do need to provide as much detail for him, what type of software, make, model, any specifics, and IT will then generate either a purchase requisition for the order and get your signatures to process if it's billing to your org, um, or send an email and for approval and asking you to place the order. So we also need to attach a copy of that approval that you've gotten from IT to make the purchase. So a few more questions that we need to do before you actually make a purchase and do I have the authority to make a purchase? Which means am I an org owner or have delegation? Do I have the approvals as needed? And if not, we need to get email approval and signature approval from non-delegate orgs. Are funds available? Always an important part. And am I getting a fair and reasonable price? Did you do your shopping? Did you price match things? If you have, it's never a bad idea to, you know, present that information as good backup documentation. And another one, are you buying goods or services? We do handle these in two different ways, depending on how we answer some of these questions. An unauthorized purchase is something that's occurred or a purchase commitment has been made to the vendor to obtain goods or services and you've not followed the rules that we've just covered and you've also made it to a person who's not authorized in the event we do do this which we should really never do we have to go through a ratification process and it's a fairly entailed one we do have to complete the form with good description, explanation of the violation, supporting document, and also the VP of Business sends it to the state controller's office for approval. We really want to try to never do this. It's really not a good plan. Also, in the event you do do this, the state decides they don't want to ratify the purchase and allow it to happen. You can be held personally liable for the cost of the purchase. So again, let's just try to skip that part. Another option that we have to buy things is if it needs to be bid. So, in big picture here, if your purchase is less than $5,000 and it's a one-time purchase within a fiscal year for either goods or services, you can pay for it on a direct pay. 
if your purchase is over $5,000 or there will be multiple purchases to the same vendor in a fiscal year, we do have to have a purchase order in place before any order is actually completed with the vendor. If what you're looking at purchasing is over $25,000, we do need to bid it out. So there's a large solicitation process that we can go through. And if this is something you're looking at doing, number one thing is just give me a call, send me an email, and we'll go through the steps that we need to do to make that happen for you. Here's sort of a rough guide on are you buying goods or services. So goods are also known as commodities or something that you're buying off the shelf or something that someone else might also want to buy. It includes things like office supplies, software, cleaning supplies, equipment, and so forth. Versus services is any time that you're having a person do something for you. And sometimes that we can be obtaining a physical good, but it still ends up as a service because we're having someone do it for us. We're not just buying a pre-done item. Such things as advertising, printing, catering, guest speakers, if you're going to have writers, things like that. Um, those are going to fall under the service category. If you're not sure, give me a call and we'll sort it out. Is my service vendor an independent contractor or an employee? So this is going to kind of determine, um, based on these criteria, whether or not they are an employee or an independent contractor. So an employee does perform duties dictated and controlled by others. So they have supervisors and so forth. They receive state resources and tools to do the work, like they're using CNCC computers and so forth, and are giving training for work to be done. They work for only one employer and receive benefits such as insurance, pension, paid leave. Independent contractors is someone that CNCC does not have direct reporting or control over how the work is done. They operate under their own business name and they will send us an invoice for the work that is going to be done. They have more than one client, so we're not the only one that they do work for, and they control the business aspects of their business. They have their own tools, they set their own hours, they keep their own books, they buy their own goods that they need to do the work for you, and they cover all their own expenses. They provide work comp and unemployment, and they may realize a profit or incur a loss. This happens a lot for us. What about a former CNCC staff? Retirees. Are the duties the same or similar to the duties carried out prior to retirement? And how long has it been since their date of retirement? And if yes, has been answered to either of those questions. They are an employee and must be put in a nine-month temp or part-time permanent position. Again, feel free to contact the business office. What if you want to hire a college staff or faculty for a small project? So there's, again, some questions that we have to ask here. Um, is it a permanent employee or a temporary adjunct? Are they performing same or similar duties? Prior college or system employee? So what are the duties and length of separation? And if it is an employee, we need to have an MOU required to complete. So a simple snapshot here of some situations, temporary employees, part-time, some actions needed. I'll let you kind of peruse this slide at your, your own leisure. And if we do need to use one again, if it's a full-time employee or we're borrowing an employee from another institution, so let's say another one of our sister colleges has something they're going to be able to do for us. We do need to have an MOU in place for that. So this is sort of also relating to price agreements and taking things out to bid. Other departments and institutions within the state have price agreements that they have set up with certain vendors. And sometimes we can piggyback on to their price agreements to get better rates on things. So there's a website, which is this www.bidscolorado.com. Always a good idea to check there to see if what you're looking for has already been negotiated down versus finding a new vendor of your own. Things like office supplies, cleaning supplies, um, a lot of things in nursing, dental hygiene, police and so forth. We also have a lot of price agreements through them, any software, hardware, 
so on and so forth. Um, so it's a good idea to just put into the habit of checking this website. And it will still follow the same rules where if you're going to be purchasing over $5,000 in a year or multiple purchases to the vendor, we still need to have a PO. So if you are getting a new vendor set up, um, and part of the thing that you're going to be doing when you're putting in your purchase requisition is we need to have a W-9. We need to have it for all vendors. So when you're calling to get your quotes and pricing from the vendors you're looking at, just make it a good habit to request their W-9 unless you know it's someone that you've done work with before and we, we have one in the system. So there is a form on CCCS's website if you do need to send a blank one to a vendor if they don't already have one completed. Simply checking the box LLC isn't enough. There are multiple filing statuses. So when they return this, do please check that box and also make sure that we can read it. That's really a key piece. Um, minority and women-owned business self-certification information is at the bottom and preferred for our state reporting, but it is not required. And if you have a foreign vendor, call us first. Dealing with foreign vendors is a separate entity altogether, and there's some other things that we have to do, so um, just make sure that we get that taken care of beforehand. Here's an example of a blank W-9 form, just so you can get familiar with it. What other documents might you need? If it's a service, we need a scope of work. So this is used to set out the details of what work is to be performed in the absence of an actual contract. It also lets us know if this person is a para-retiree and that we have to fill that information out. It includes payment and billing details. Um, typically, we do not cover travel expenses for independent contractors. In a few cases where travel is necessary, it does have to be pre-approved by the VP of Business prior to signing. And we really do not do advanced payments whenever possible. Um, it is a risk to the state. We try not to do it. And also requires additional approval from the VP of Business before we agree to advance pay anyone. Here's a sample form of the scope of work. This is also located um, on the S drive. So in the event you do need to have someone who's an independent contractor that we use for services, there's another form that we need to fill out. I'm not going to hit too hard on this because we don't do a tremendous amount of these. Um, but all single entity owners, regardless of dollar amount, include LLCs. And we do have to attach it to the purchase order. And we cannot reuse them. Certain types of things that we do, we also need to have insurance. So whether it's high risk or low risk, and we'll kind of help sort out for you if you do need to have insurance provided when you're making your purchase. So getting back to a simple purchase order, um, no matter what it is we're doing, you need to have pre-approval before any purchase is made whatsoever. And if it will be being placed on a purchase order, the purchase order has to be in place before the purchase is made. I cannot stress that enough. If we have something that we have an invoice before we have a purchase order, that's a really big problem and includes words like fiscal violations with the state. We want to avoid that. And make sure that you're using the latest version of the form, which is located on the S drive as well. You complete the form, fill out all of the information, there's a section on the bottom for a business purpose, so we need to know why you are looking to get what you're getting. Please fill out the vendor information as completely as possible, so include their name, their billing address. If you have the S number, that's great. Uh, do please put the org code on, and if it is being split between multiple, we need both org owners to sign the same form. And we also have to have the appropriate levels of signatures for the dollar level of the request. If it's relating to Perkins, safe to say, let's just call Megan. So again, if you're purchasing goods, to be a little repetitive here, if it's over $5,000 or multiple transactions with a single vendor in a fiscal year, we have to have a PO. If it's under $5,000, we can do it on a direct pay. You have to include any quotes. So if you're looking to purchase very specific items with specific quantities, 
go ahead and supply that with us. It also helps when you're going to finalize and make your order with the vendor. You can reference back to the quote number and it fills a little faster versus starting all over. We do have to include shipping whenever shipping is on there. It does line item out as a separate piece on the purchase order. And again, if it's under $5,000, we can do a direct pay or one time to a vendor. If it's for services, we need to check the approved vendor for services list. You don't have to have a purchase order as long as it's still fitting the dollar amount requirements. And purchase requisition is needed for non-approved vendors and all purchases over 5000 even if there's a contract. Again, please include any backup documentation you have. The more information we have, the better off things are. Here's a copy of the current direct pay purchase order purchase requisition form. The form covers all of the components there. It's the section in the yellow if you need a purchase order or if what you're submitting has an invoice attached. So you'll put check boxes in the appropriate places. If it is something you're issuing a purchase order for, there is also a box where either I will make the purchase for you or you'll be making the purchase yourself once your purchase order has been generated. Please allow time. There's a handful of steps that it takes from the time you submit it to the time you get it back. It's not an instant process, although we do try to go as fast as we can. So the purchase requisition goes to me, purchasing agent. I have to check for all of the required documents are there, that your quote is attached, your business purpose is there, the vendor information is correct, your quantities are good, that we have a W-9, that the scope of work, if it's necessary, or the pararetiree are there and in insurance, so I have a lot of things I need to check for. And I also need to verify that the org code you put in is good. I have to allocate the commodity code or the expense code that your purchase will fall under. And we also have to make sure that all of the appropriate authorities for the dollar amount have been met with signatures on your request. So if your purchase is $10,000, it's a dean and director. $200,000 is the vice president or president. And system office president is over $500,000. CNCC also has a rule in place that any purchase under $500 has to have two levels of signature authority, and it's the initiator and or owner and dean or instructor. Any purchase $500 and more has to be reviewed by a vice president and additional approvals sought from there. A lot of times the VP of business will be that third signature. Can a payment authorization for services be issued? Yes, but the purchasing manager signs off. And is a PO required? And I enter it into Banner, issue the purchase order, I then save it into the S drive, and I email the requester when the purchase order has been completed and whether or not the box has been checked that I will make the purchase or you will make the purchase. Um, I will either advise, yes, I have made the purchase and here's your shipping information or your purchase order is complete, you're free to order whenever you so choose. And again, can't stress it, be sure we don't need to bid it. So if you're looking at purchasing something that will cost over $25,000 in a fiscal year, it has to go to bid no matter what. There are a series of types of bids that we can do, one of which is a document quote. So that is for anything up to $150,000. It does have to post out to a state solicitation for a minimum of three days, um, but we prefer one to two weeks. Um, a lot of it is based on where we are. Sometimes being remote is a little harder for people to get their submissions in in a timely basis. There is also an RFP or an IFB, and this is for things over $150,000. And obviously we want the best solicitations to come in for what it is we're looking for. So if we can allow for more time for people to review and compile these solicitations, that helps. So a minimum of 15 days, but in a dream world, 30 would be great. And this is something that the requester and the purchasing office will work very closely together on to make sure that we have all the information and what we're sending out to get our bids in is as accurate as possible. 
And we always have to try to award to the apparent lowest cost vendor unless there are a few other criteria. So the more information you can provide for the bid and the more we can get it detailed out, the better chance we have to get what we need for the best price possible. So a documented quote is again between 25 and 150,000 and it's used when the specifications are known and clear. So you know you want 10,000 basketballs and it's gonna cost $50,000 we can put out 10,000 basketballs, whatever it might be. There are some subject, subjective criteria allowed for quality. We do need to try to post between one and two weeks and allow time for us to get together to develop the bid solicitation for content, thoroughness, information, so that when we post it, our vendors don't have to ask too many questions as to what it is we're needing. And the price is the primary consideration, but there are other factors. It's a more informal process than other solicitations. So there's an RFP, which is used when we don't necessarily know the specifications that we want or how we need to get there. They do need to be posted a little longer. This can be a multi-stage process. Um, and can take multiple months to start and finish this process. And there are evaluations and committees, contracts that have to be done. It's, it's a fairly formal process and takes a, a decent amount of time. So if it's something you think you might be doing, we need to get communication started so that we don't run out of time. Another thing that's available is a sole source, but we don't have a lot of these. Um, but it's used only when one product or service will work and there's only one vendor who will provide it. So certain utilities and things where we live fall under this criteria. Um, so we just need to also provide the justification as to why this vendor is meeting both of those criteria. And it's not because we didn't take the time to put it out to solicitation or because you have a favorite vendor that you just really want to use. That doesn't work. So in the event you are looking for a particular commodity, multiple vendors can meet the need. We do have to put it out to bid and we have to use a little bit of time to get that all put together. Consider how to pay for it. So check to make sure that the vendor's math is correct and the amount of the bill is correct. Check your agreement and your scope of work. If they sent you a message that Shipping is free and included with your order and shipping shows up on the invoice, go back to the vendor and tell them, hey, you bid this with free shipping, you cannot charge me shipping. Uh, things like that, it's an easy one that kind of gets lumped in. We do have to sign and attach any pack slip that yes, you have received the quantity and the description of the goods that you ordered. You sign off on any invoices as received and you have to write okay to pay. You physically have to sign it and date it and reference the purchase order number um, and make sure that what you ordered is what you got. And if there's no purchase order or payment authorization, we do have to provide the Oregon Commodity Code um, for the purchase. We have to include the same thing as backup documentation. So it could be your payment authorization, list of attendees or meetings, depending on if you're doing like official functions and so forth. And a very important ingredient Account payable deadline for payment is noon on Thursday for the following Tuesday check run. It sounds a little confusing. You might want to read that a couple of times, but just make sure you have everything in to AP by noon on Thursday if you want it to make the next check run. So all purchases on a purchase order do have to be broken down by line. So you can't just lump in a total of t-shirts and you have a variety of t-shirts. We need some quantities and prices, especially if there are different prices for sizes and so forth. And you have to attach a copy of the purchase order to an invoice every time. If it is goods and services under 5,000, we can get an invoice and do a direct pay and submit that straight to accounts payable. So this is the way that the state is handling purchasing today. Things do change, especially in the ways we're living today. When they do, we try to communicate as best we can, as quickly as we can. 
And if all else fails, please contact anyone in the business office. Any one of us will be able to answer or route you through to the appropriate person to get the questions answered that you need. If you have any questions, you can call me. My number is 970-675-3237. And I'm not going to bore you with the spelling of my name on an email. But I am in the directory, and I can also tell you over the phone. Thanks so much.